I'm here today with Mario Gabelli, who's the chairman and CEO of Gabelli Asset Management, or GAMCO. And uh, Mario, cannot thank you enough for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. Before we begin talking about your career, let's talk a little bit about what life is like growing up in the Bronx. I was born in the Bronx yeah. on what is the equivalent of Orchard Street today, between 174th and Batgate Avenue and 169th Street. There were all the little vendors that would sell goods. And people from all over the area would go there. It was a very simple, and at three or four or five years old, you walk down the stairs, you walk up and down the street, and you uh, watch what's going on. Today, uh, you can't do that. But one of the fun things I used to do was to calculate how much it would cost for someone to buy three pounds of bananas or whatever they put on a scale faster than the guy behind the counter could do it. And so I got to uh, practice a lot of numbers. In addition to that, I had my first job. I would actually show up shining shoes at the train station on 3rd Avenue and 174th Street. Right as uh, probably five or six years old. And I still have that same shoebox today, just in case. Everywhere I read, you made your first investment when you were 13 years old. What got you interested in the stock market? I had a lot of different jobs over the period of time. And when you're 12 years old, you need to get working papers so somebody can hire you. So I wound up going to a golf course that somehow thought I was 13 so I could caddy. Most of the caddies were bussed in from Yonkers, so they'd get on the bus at around 7.30, 8 o'clock, come up, and then the bus would go back to Yonkers at around 4, 4.30. Meanwhile, because I either hitchhiked or somehow got up there, I would stay around till I wanted to. And at around 3 or 4, the specialist from the exchanges would come up to play 9 holes or 18 holes of golf, and I got to listen to what they were doing, it was kind of intrigued me. I wound up buying IT&T, Pepsi-Cola, Beach Aircraft, and one other company at that time, Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. And I got into following those dynamics by reading the Wall Street Journal, and I had a, actually a subscription to Business Week. And then you went to Fordham? Well, I grew up in the Bronx and I went to a public school and I cut out a class in the first grade so my mother decided that uh, I needed a little more discipline so she yanked me and I was left back and I went to a Catholic grammar school on 177th which happens to still be there and it's located across from a police station. So the religious types that called nuns said if you cut out a class, A, we have a police station across the street, they'll find you and secondly they'll have a uh, spanking machine upstairs on the fifth floor. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, so that, uh, I never cut out a class after in grammar school. I never missed a class, grammar school, high school, graduate school, and, and so on. So, and then I did go to Fordham. I was an accounting finance major, and I've had some wonderful professors there. For example, there's a fellow by the name of Amy Kelly who was ca uh, getting his PhD degree at Columbia. He was teaching money and banking. And Eamon then became president of Tulane. So I got to know him down there. And so you, you develop a lot of uh, different dynamics and challenges. Then I went to Columbia Business School and uh, I was a PhD uh, program at NYU for a while, but I got too busy from travel schedule as a sell side research. So yeah. I, didn't, I didn't go. Did you go from, uh, from Fordham to Columbia or did you, did you go to Loeb Roads? What was no, the what happened is that in the, that period of time, you didn't have that two or three year time period between undergrad and grad school. Mm. And so you could immediately go to graduate school. Okay. So I joined Loeb I graduated on a Friday, went to Loeb Roads on a Monday. On that Friday night, Michael Steinhardt quit and started the most successful hedge fund, Steinhardt Berkowitz Fine, that lasted between 1969 and until he uh, decided to give the money back in 1994. But I picked up his industries. Okay. And they just said, hey, Michael covered autos, farm equipment, and conglomerates, period companies that were around at that time. And that's what I started doing as an analyst, sell side by, on the uh, research. Okay, and what was that whole experience like when you were working at a big firm? And when did you decide to go and set up your own shop? I stayed there about seven or eight years, and then about 1973 or four, I went to an institutional research firm that's strictly focused on research, and there were about seven or eight or nine of those at the time. They were names like C.J. Lawrence, Mitchell Hutchins, Baker Weeks, uh, and so on, Farka Dawkins, Donaldson Lufkin Generate, and William D. Witter was one of those. Uh, I was in pig heaven. In other words, research was king. You learn how to really understand the process of gathering, arraying, projecting, which is what we do. But you also had a, a client base that were the best minds that uh, you could knock on a door of and they would compete with you. So they merged into Drexel Burnham. 
Okay. I walked into Tubby Burnham. I said, Tubby, you're wonderful. You're a great investor. You're like Mr. Loeb, but you're too big. So I uh, was figuring out what to do. And I had a couple of opportunities to join Bear Stearns, join other firms as an analyst. But I met a guy in Denver who I've known. And he said, Mario, start your own firm. So we started a cell side research firm. And we sold our research to companies like General Motors and so on for cash and also had institutional clients. But within a week or two, it was clear that people would knock on my door and say, why don't you manage some money for us? So that's the, ba the basic part of that business. And there were a total of two individuals. It was me and an associate. That associate, however, didn't join me until about uh, a month after I started. And at that time, there was a phone strike. We couldn't get a phone. I wanted an address on Wall Street, right? So on the corner of Wall and William, there was a payphone because the building had no payphones. In the snowy days, it happened to snow as well, I'm out there making phone calls, putting coins in. One of my friends walks by, he says, and this was Mickey Strauss, he said, Mario, now I know what you meant by having an office on Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> So there were a lot of startup dynamics like that, like mailing out our first research report, of licking stamps on the envelopes, having the wrong weight, and so many wonderful stories. So Mary, you've been one of the most successful money managers out there today. Tell us a little bit about your investing philosophy and how that sort of evolved over time, because obviously you've had to uh, shape yourself and, and morph into and have different philosophies and strategies during the past you know, 30 years or so. So the methodology today is no different than before, though it's a lot easier to accomplish. And that is, as an analyst, you follow an industry, you get a circle of competence. That is, how much do you know about companies, as an example, in the automotive industry? There are parts retailers like O'Reilly's, AutoZone, Napa Genuine Parts. One of my first visits was to a company in Atlanta, Georgia called Genuine Parts. They have the Napa stores, and we still follow them. And essentially, you learn how to gather data, array the data, project the data, and interpret it. So what is a business worth? And then we, as sell-side analysts, at the time, you had to communicate, which means lots of written material, lots of calls to your counterpart on, in quotes, the institutions that paid for your research. And so that's what we did. So we developed a very strong philosophy. Because I covered autos, I was following cyclical consumer durables. Because I was following the auto parts, I came up with covering the auto aftermarket. That is companies that supplied parts to the population of cars on the road rather than the companies. And then because I followed conglomerates, I learned how to do a lot of uh, you know companies like Gulf and Western, Litton Industries, Teledyne, and so on. And so those disciplines uh, I covered intensely by going to see every company that was public for the first two years of coverage. Then I picked up the broadcasting and movie industry. So I was one of the few that went out to LA religiously to visit with the public companies. Columbia Pictures was here on Fifth Avenue, but most of the others were out on the West Coast. And there was another fellow by the name of Alan Cohn at, at Wertheim. And so we would follow the movie companies doing the same thing and then communicating. And then when Star Wars came out in 1977, the whole world changed for the a lot of analysts started covering that industry. There were probably a, more than the, just one or two at the time, and I'm just giving that as an example. Okay, so it. that's what we do, nothing more. Uh, so our circle of competence has changed. So if in 1980 or 81 I would go to China or Japan, I would go visit the car company, and I did. And in 1977, we took analysts around factories in Europe. It was not to buy those stocks of the Renault or Toyota but to understand the dots in the world. After the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, November, and after Tiananmen Square, which was June of 1989, we started changing our focus and saying, okay, we're gonna do research globally. What are your views right now in terms of, you know, obviously we got this whole Greece issue occurring. Does that make you nervous? Are you worrying about it having an effect on Portugal and Italy and uh, getting out of control? Or do you just think this is a blip that'll correct itself in the next Months. We've had a significant number of cha challenges over the last 150 years in the stock market. You know, we had the panic of 1893, 1893, 1867, 1907, 1919, a really nasty time in a, a 2930, another one in 36, another one in, you know, I do, so I keep going right through the cycles. So you had a lot of these things that happened. This year you have a kind of a, a renewed focus on Greece, and this uh, just recently an issue on China. You have other issues. There are always something in the mix that's topical. And the press today will loves 
this. The media is phenomenal. When I was uh, starting my career, you know, it was a Friday night special with Lou Rukeyser. Right. That was the only game in town, okay? And then you had Alan Abelson at Barron's, was a great gifted writer, and you had a few that worked for, uh, you know, the Business Week or the Wall Street Journal and others like that. But today, you can start, in fact, you do. Uh, Bloomberg's 24 hours, you know, CNBC, you could start early in the morning, uh, Fox News, yeah. uh, you've got uh, BBC, you've got everything you want. And in addition to that, your little iPad. Right. So I, I used to work from 7 in the morning till 11 at night, sometimes 12. Now I, I changed a little bit because time moves on. I start at 5 okay. and I, I quit at 9. Good for you. Good. It is what it is. So the notion of uh, somebody listening to this is simple. You're, everyone's smart. Everyone can gather data. Everyone's fast. Everyone uh, has a passion for what they do, but there's one difference. So to succeed, you really have to work. When everybody says work from 9 to 5, you've got to work from 5 to 9. It's not complicated.